written and directed by Sean Wong, now playing in select theaters. Demand for oil keeps rising, but for how much longer? Just last year, about one in five cars sold globally was an electric vehicle. I'm Amy Scott, planning for peak oil next time on Marketplace. This evening at 6.30 on WNYC. You're listening to Marketplace on WNYC. In the 7 o'clock hour of All Things Considered, investors are betting the central bank will be ready to start cutting interest rates in September. We'll take a closer look at the economy at 7 o'clock. Stay tuned. This is Marketplace. I'm Amy Scott. Global demand for oil just keeps growing. Despite climate pledges and investment in alternatives, demand has only fallen once in the past dozen years, in 2020, at the start of the COVID pandemic. And then it quickly roared back. But how long demand will keep growing is an important question for oil producers and for clean energy advocates. Goldman Sachs recently projected that peak oil, when demand tops out before it begins declining, won't happen until the mid-2030s. BP, the former British Petroleum, says it could happen next year. Other estimates range from a few years to decades away. Marketplace's Henry Epp reports on why these forecasts differ so much and why they matter. For decades, oil demand and economic growth have pretty much gone hand in hand. Steadily increasing demand is highly correlated with global GDP, global income. Christoph Ruhl is a senior researcher at the Center for Global Energy Policy at Columbia University. Very simply, the richer people get, and the more people in the world get rich, the more they drive. Growing, globalized economies also demand more oil for shipping goods across oceans, flying people and stuff in planes, and making things with petrochemicals. From your plastic bag to uh, play toys for children. Plus fertilizer, cosmetics, and asphalt. In other words, economies that make more stuff and move more people around demand more oil. But that might be changing. This idea that oil and the economy are kind of joined at the hip, that's no longer the case. Clark Williams Derry is with the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis. He says this is happening for a few reasons. For one, just last year, about one in five cars sold globally was an electric vehicle. At the same time, gas and diesel-powered vehicles are getting more efficient, says Christoph Ruhl at Columbia, and so are other sectors. The same is true for the oil which is used in shipping and in flying, and the same is true for the oil which is used to produce plastic bags and things like that. Plus, most countries have signed on to the Paris Climate Agreement, pledging to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, which generally means cutting oil use. All of these factors, more EVs, better fuel efficiency, lower carbon emissions, mean that oil demand will probably stop growing at some point. And for planning purposes, the oil industry and its investors would like to know when. But that is really hard to forecast. Alan Gelder works on making one of those forecasts for the consulting firm Wood McKenzie. It's largely the assumptions around economic activity and the rate at which new technologies penetrate, that's largely the driver of those differences between the various scenarios that you see. One wild card, he says, is how quickly new technologies develop, particularly EVs. But technology isn't the only factor. I think we'd really have to see a major shift in the culture as well in order to actually see oil demand dropping. <laughs> Ellen R. Wald is a fellow at the Atlantic Council. She says countries could miss their climate pledges or EV sales could fall short. Their growth in the U.S. has slowed recently. So she's skeptical that forecasts of peak oil demand are anywhere near accurate. They're just saying, if X, Y, and Z happen, you're going to see this. Or if A, B, and C happen, you're going to see that. However everything plays out, the fact that oil companies and analysts are even talking about a potential date for peak oil is significant, says Clark Williams Derry at the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis, because the uncertainty about when it might happen is rubbing off on investors in the oil and gas industry. Just the fact that they're thinking about it, just the fact that they're taking this issue seriously, is a sea change for the oil industry that has relied for decades on a perception of inevitability in oil demand growth. 
and that perception of inevitability, Williams Dairy says, has been punctured. I'm Henry App for Marketplace. The shortage of affordable housing in this country for low-income people is well-known. And history shows just how hard it can be to get projects built. In the 1960s, the township of Mount Laurel, New Jersey, moved to condemn dilapidated housing where many black residents lived. Worried about her neighbors, a woman named Ethel Lawrence proposed a plan for an affordable housing project that could help the displaced residents find homes. When leaders refused, Lawrence and a group of activists took the township to court. Roshan Abraham wrote about Mount Laurel and the affordable housing battle that ensued for The New York Times. Roshan, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. So tell me about Ethel Lawrence. Who was she and why did she want to build affordable housing in her community? Yeah, Ethel Lawrence was a uh, mother. She had been a school teacher. She had been like very involved in her community. So she kind of took it upon herself to join up with local activist groups and try to get affordable housing built for her family and for her extended family. And she had been there for, I think like her family had been there for six generations. They had been there a long time and it was very personal for her that they be able to remain in Mount Laurel. And so ultimately she had to sue to try to get this house housing built. Can you tell us about the court case that led to the Mount Laurel doctrine? Yeah, so she was connected with uh, a group of young lawyers from a law firm called uh, Camden Legal Services. And they all agreed that she would be a great lead plaintiff for this lawsuit that would, you know, essentially was um, trying to get affordable housing built in Mount Laurel. Um, The state Supreme Court eventually Uh, decided in 1975 that not only did Mount Laurel have to build its fair share of affordable housing, the entire state of New Jersey would be required to build its fair share of affordable housing. And that led to really like 50 years worth of back and forth trying to block housing. And that got us to what we have today. So this doctrine uh, is now state law in New Jersey. How much affordable housing has been built as a result? Uh, There have been 70,000 units of affordable housing built since 1980 as a result of Mount Laurel. Which doesn't sound like a lot, right? But but as the headline reads in your story, it's a win. It doesn't sound like a lot. Yeah. Um, it's not as much as the need. And I think like a housing assessment of New Jersey found something like 200,000 units are still needed for the most low income households. But yeah, it's way more than would have been without Mount Laurel. I think most people agree. And just as an example of how hard it is to get affordable housing built, you mentioned a development in in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. I think it's 50-some units, and it's taken 25 years to build. Yeah, so that was a development where the original plan for the development, uh, the affordable housing was part of the original plan. Um, For whatever reason, when the housing was constructed, the single-family home units were built first, and then the affordable housing units, which were always planned to be part of the development, were going to be built after. But then after the uh, residents moved into the single family homes, they began protesting the idea of having that affordable housing right next to them. So there were tons of back and forth lawsuits. And after it was built, the complaints just seemed to disappear. No one was protesting anything, nothing, none of the sort of 
apocalyptic scenarios that they envisioned came to pass. And yeah, it seems to be doing well. This kind of resistance plays out in communities all across the country. Are you seeing other states pursuing similar measures as New Jersey? Yeah. um, I mean, different states are trying different versions of Mount Laurel, but I don't think that any area has quite the same rigorous system as the Mount Laurel system with which both has uh, this system of allotments based on, you know, what the income levels are of the people who actually live in the town and also has really robust funding mechanisms to actually build that housing and has both a judicial and now a legislative uh, framework that legally mandates that to be built. Did Ethel Lawrence ever get to see affordable housing built in her community, Mount Laurel? No, she, the last thing that she did see is one of the lawyers from Camden Legal Services showed her a plot of land that was in Mount Laurel that is named after her and that exists today called the Ethel Lawrence Houses. But she never lived to see the actual housing that was built there. Um, Some of her relatives' grandchildren are living in affordable housing that was created through the um, Mount Laurel Doctrine. But Ethel herself never lived to see that uh, affordable housing built. Hmm. Roshan Abraham wrote about the Mount Laurel Doctrine and what it's meant for affordable housing for the New York Times. Thank you so much. Thank you. Marketplace is supported by Babbel for Business. With over 13,000 hours of language courses, Babbel is helping businesses break down language barriers and improve workplace safety. Learn more at babbelforbusiness.com. And by OneStream, the enterprise finance platform that unifies financial and operational data using the power of AI, helping businesses forecast faster and more accurately at onestream.com. This final note on the way out today, one more from Chair Powell at that press conference today about weighing an interest rate cut during an election. The bottom line is, if we do our very best to do our part and we stick to our part, that will benefit all Americans. If we get it right, the economy will be stronger, we'll have price stability, people will find jobs, wages will rise in real terms, everyone will benefit. So that's what we believe, and that's how we will always act. This is my fourth presidential election at the Fed. I can tell you this is how we think about it. This is what we do. So it's, it, anything that we do before, during, or after the election will, will be based on the data, the outlook, and the balance of risks, and not on anything else. Expect to hear that a few more times before November 5th. Our media production team includes Brian Allison, Jake Cherry, Jessen Dooler, Drew Jostad, Gary O'Keefe, Charlton Thorpe, Juan Carlos Torado, and Becca Weinman. Jeff Peters is the manager of media production. I'm Amy Scott. Hope to see you tomorrow. This is APM.